guys, I'm going to kick off with the introduction because um, it's not the meat of the seminar. So if people come a bit later, they won't miss anything important. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to Dante Street Chambers. I am Fiona Murphy, and I'm a member of our Actions Against the Police and Inquests and Inquiries teams. This is the fourth in a series of Dante Street Chambers virtual events, bringing together practitioners and policymakers to discuss with our associate, David Lammy MP, Black Lives Matters issues. And this is the first where we turn our attention to policing, um, policing being the front line in our black community's experience of racism. For this strand of the series, Maya Sakan, Queen's Council, and I will be co-chairing the events. Maya needs no introduction to this audience. Uh, we were delighted to welcome her back to Dodger Street Chambers uh, her home, her Dodger Street Chambers home last autumn and to celebrate her taking silk this March. So it's been quite the lockdown for Maya. Um, Maya is of course a leading specialist in police law and racial justice issues have been at the forefront of her practice since representing the Commission for, Commission for Racial Equality at the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry. And I think that must be 25 years ago now. Turning then to the format for this evening, um, our focus tonight will be on the police oversight bodies, particularly the Independent Office for Police Conduct and the Home Affairs Select Committee, um, bodies who hold responsibility to address structural, institutional and overt racism in policing. We're going to ask what is working and what needs to change. We're going to ask David Lemmy MP to open the event by scoping the issues that concern him. As a campaigning MP, David has taken up the cause of the Windrush generation, the Grenfell bereaved and countless victims of police racism and brutality. What has David learned from inside government and what would he change? And I think if I say, uh, if he gets into government, David might be a bit annoyed. So I'm going to say when David gets into government, when he returns um, to government, to the front bench, um, what would he change? We ask David to open with some thoughts on, on those topics. And we're then going to hear from Claire Bassett, the Deputy Director General of the Independent Office for Police Conduct. And she's been in post since September 2020, not the easiest time to get to know a new organization. Um, but she has a fresh perspective um, and we may hear this evening that it's considered that one is needed. Claire is undoubtedly a highly experienced chief executive and she has experience of a number of organizations familiar to this audience, including the Parole Board, the CCRC, the Legal Services Commission and NACRO. Um, but perhaps it's going to be her most recent posting at the Department for International Trade that will have equipped her best for sorting out the IOPC. And finally, uh, we have Sean McDotta, a partner in police law specialist firm, Bart Murphy. Um, Sean Mc is on the executive committee of the London Anti-Racist Alliance, and he's a leading practitioner with extensive experience of the IOPC and indeed the Home Affairs Select Committee to whom he has given evidence regarding these issues. Once in 2010, regarding the predecessor organization to the IOPC, the then IPCC, and again, very recently. So we hope that Sean will give us some insights into his experience of working with that committee. We appreciate, we anticipate that these presentations will take about 45 minutes, allowing scope for lively discussion. Uh, and we're aiming to wrap up at about 7 p.m. And so with that briefest of introductions, I'm going to hand over to David. Thank you, David. Well, look, thank you very much indeed. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm really pleased that as we try to conceive what would be a slightly different event from the usual sort of event you'd have in this area, we were able to get the uh, IOPC represented here. And I hope we can have meaningful discussion. Look, I would have thought quite a lot of people on here would be in the same position that I am, which is that um, what is required when we look over the course of history is fundamental change. And fundamental change can only really come about when there is an acknowledgement that we do have a genuine problem 
of systemic racism in our country. And it exists across a range of organizations, but wherever minority communities are on the front line, they, where they abut policing and people in uniform particularly, and the criminal justice system, that is where it will be at its most acute. And there are issues of great depth that one could dive into as to why that is the case. But in the absence of that acknowledgement, and I say that because of course, we're living in times of both the Sewell report and there is genuine concern in the broader community that the current commissioner feels that the Met has moved on from issues of institutional racism, that this remains problematic. And I think we have to acknowledge that. And I have to say as the custodian of the constituency of Tottenham, and I do say that as the custodian because whoever is the future member of parliament for Tottenham, they would have to negotiate that we have had five black people die at the hands of the police. And so policing in Tottenham always has that in its consciousness. And I'm talking, of course, about Cynthia Jarrett, about Joy Gardner, about Roger Sylvester, about Mark Duggan and about Jermaine Baker. All of those cases high profile, all of them imbued in policing in the constituency I represent, and frankly, all of them totemic within the wider black community. And you know the statistics about those that have died at the hands of the police, lost their life or indeed been harmed significantly at the hands of the police over the course of the last decade, certainly the last um, 20 years. Uh, and there are issues in relation to fear of black communities. There are issues in relation to deeply held judgments about black communities, particularly a black man in distress like Roger Sylvester, that go to the heart of why that should be. And there are issues about transparency and openness. Now, uh, what I mean by that is what has historically gone on hidden from the public has been a problematic area. There have been moves, of course, things like technology, meaning that um, um, video recorders uh, that can record police contact incidents assist with that process, but there are still issues with getting access uh, to that in a transparent and open way and machines turned on and switched off and all the rest of it. So that issue rumbles on. I want to say a couple of things. The one is to acknowledge that we are on a journey and to set this in obviously some international context. And that is to say that in my lifetime, I've seen the police complaints, authority i've seen the ipc ipcc ppc and we now got the uh, independent office of uh, police conduct uh, has that been progress my instinct is on its most recent incarnation in my interaction with them there has been some progress um, I, I think that the deep concerns about the police investigating themselves still exist, but are not quite as loud. I think the ability to initiate uh, investigations, um, to insist, if you like, on investigations is quite important rather than relying on the police to refer uh, themselves. And I also think a slightly more shortened process um, uh, uh, has been very important and a more responsiveness to communities right from the get-go, learning from the problems that arose in Mark Duggan are significant and should be acknowledged, uh, but practitioners here will want to get into the weeds of that and they may well challenge some of that, but that's just my impression sitting as a member of parliament. But there will remain issues and others will want to get in to those issues. I want to say also that it is important that we at Doughty Street and others are able also to have this sort of discussion with those that decide on prosecution. And that is to say that we must not leave to one side um, the prosecution process and what happens there. And in fact, the inquest process and what's involved there and how that has a bearing on this wider discussion. And I guess 
when we get to that, we have also got to remember, and this is where select committees become really important, the weariness, the tiredness, the frustration, the bitterness, the cynicism that exists in communities because of successive deep dive inquiries and reports and a sense that the progress has been pretty slim relative to that. I'm thinking of Scarman, I'm thinking of McPherson, I'm thinking recently of my review, um, and I'm thinking of Angelini, but there have been others. And this sense that who is there to insist upon implementation? Now, this is a wider set of issues. It goes to b issues beyond race. Uh, uh, it goes to issues about what is the status of the inquiry. And of course, we've got the Grenfell inquiry taking place. But I did want to dig out uh, some facts here. The number of inquiries have got, has gone up dramatically. Uh, 68 public inquiries since 1990, and that compared with 19 prior to that. Uh, they can take years. So there is a sense of the possibility of kicking things into the long grass, on average two and a half years. But of course, the Bloody Sunday inquiry took 12 years, and Chilcot into Iraq took seven. Uh, but I think the big issue is who gets to ensure that these things are implemented? And we know that only six public inquiries in this last period have received full scrutiny about the implementation of those inquiries. It's interesting because we're coming up, of course, to the anniversary of the Brixton riots, which takes us back to Scarman, and we're coming up to the anniversary of the 2011 riots in August which takes us up to the review that was done after those riots. And there's a real question about who implements or scrutinizes and forces governments, governments that change to implement these reviews. Now, I suspect that a lot that we'll hear from the I IOPC, and certainly that's what I hear, are about these sort of lessons learned reviews. There's a culture in which the police make a mistake and a lesson is learned but I come back to this deeper and more profound place, is does this subject require incremental change that sometimes doesn't focus not just on the police as an institution, but the individuals who've done wrongdoing, understanding that so few police are ever prosecuted for what has gone wrong, particularly where there has been a loss of life um, in our historical memory, but also that um, the lessons learn detracts from that fundamental or systemic problem of institutional racism that most communities uh, uh, would say genuinely exist. So that's a, that's a panoptic sense of, I think, the nature of this uh, problem that I think still exists and the journey that we are on acknowledging that there has been some progress, but saying that that incrementalism, and we haven't, we haven't been able to look at the CPS and others, means that there's gonna be much, much more, I suspect, to do over the coming months and years. I'll end there and let our others come in. Thank you, David. Um, Claire, with that introduction, tell us how the IOPC is completely different to its predecessors. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I would just start by saying it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. As you said, um, I, I only started in my role in September, which has put me in the really unusual position that I have literally only met a handful of my colleagues in person and even fewer of our stakeholders. So I am really grateful for this opportunity, um, even if it is a virtual one. Um, and uh, you, you very kindly set out a little bit about what I've done previously, and I am really, really pleased to be back, uh, as someone put it the other day, in a, in a life of crime. Um, it, it is a real pleasure to be back and doing this job. Um, I, I do come to this with very much an open mind. Um, I share Michael's ambition to really deliver that change at the IOPC. Um, and to do that, we do need to hear from all of our stakeholders, uh, and that, that's the spirit in which I come today. 
Um, but actually, I just wanted to start by uh, just having a look at what actually has been achieved in the last couple of years. I count myself as really lucky. I think my timing for once is really good. I have joined the IOPC uh, after a lot of change has been delivered. And I'm just going to really quickly run through some of that because I think it can be lost sight of and I think it, it's really important to appreciate it. The first bit is just some of the numbers. So if you look at the number of cases that we're concluding in uh, under 12 months, uh, three years ago, that was 68%. It's now at 91%. Um, I get the list each month of cases which are over 12 months, and it's, it's roughly between 25 and 30 cases long. So it, it is a big change. We still want to do it quicker, but a significant improvement has been delivered. Um, we inherited over 500 legacy cases from the IPCC. We've now only got three of those left. So again, that's been a real mountain moving that. Um, the changes in the legislation have been mentioned um, and some of the new powers we've had around that are really welcome. Um, I think the uh, introducing an emphasis on learning um, has made a real difference. We've now made over 400 learning recommendations. And I think it's really important to, show that the, to remember that a lot of the research shows that's what the public want to see. They want to see that improvement um, and being able to deliver that is really important. So that, that's made a difference and it has been there. I think there's also been some really significant improvements in the way that the IOPC works. Um, we have been focusing through our future design work uh, on improving areas like disclosure, on our interactions with witnesses, on the training and accreditation of our investigators and staff. And we've now got 76% of them accredited, which is a big shift from where we were three years ago. Um, however, that doesn't mean we're complacent and there is still a lot to do. And I'm just very briefly going to touch on some of the improvements we're still planning, particularly around timeliness and the quality of our work. Um, one of the, the main parts of our future design work is about improving underlying case management, and that's what we now need to allow us to improve the levels of service we offer everyone to get that timeliness even better. And I think really importantly to that whole system change, better capture and use data from our work. The systems we have at the moment and that I've found coming in are very fragmented and very old, and it makes it really hard to use that data, particularly from, for example, our complaints work effectively. And, and having a new system to do that will make a real difference. We have already made some changes. So we have um, got the new disclosure management system and we'll be introducing a digital evidence management system in the next few weeks, all of which are very back room, but they will allow us to play our role and, and function much better in that. Um, when Michael came in, he was very clear that we needed to fix our house first, and that's what we've been focusing on. We've been really working to drive up that timeliness and, and that quality. And as I mentioned, we've invested heavily in upskilling and accrediting our staff. Uh, we've also put in place work like minimum quality standards for investigations, quality reviews, introduced a critical case review panel, uh, and of course, the victim right to review and a wider stakeholder engagement. So we've seen a lot of change there. And I think those are really positive things that allow us to build on and now start to look outwards more and develop that more. And a really important part of that has been the introduction of our thematic work and the subject matter networks. And these look at a range of different areas and they include discrimination, mental health, um, APSP, um, areas like that. And what they've done is allowed us to develop our in-house expertise and work more closely with communities and other experts around this to really focus on particular issues. And race and disproportionate use of police powers is a really important example of this. Um, and just to, to share a few stats with you, last year we, we saw, as you would probably expect in the circumstances, we saw the number of race discrimination referrals increase by 22%, so 233 of those came in, from which we started 53 independent investigations. And we know, as has been much more eloquently outlined already, you know, minority ethnic youth have very low confidence in policing, and particularly when it comes to stop and search, taser and the use of COVID powers. Um, and it was in response to the Black Lives Matters protest last summer that we launched this thematic work. And what we're doing is we're using that power to call in cases as well as to select cases from those referred to us to increase the number of cases in a particular theme, and in this case race discrimination, that we independently investigate and where that's a potential factor. And we're doing using that to develop a body of evidence that will allow us to identify systemic issues and what we should do or what we should be done more widely to address that. Um, 
Now we've been looking at and identifying trends and patterns through that, and that will then hopefully drive real change. So an example of that is around where issues of disproportionality and potential discrimination are not overt. You know, it, it isn't very often that you see an out and out right overt case of racism now. Much more commonly, it involves actions or decisions or behaviors which are enforced by bias and stereotyping. And this, this means that it, it's, it's easier to establish the discrimination by looking at patterns of behavior across a number of incidents than just that single encounter. So what we've done is we've looked at where relevant patterns of behavior evidence is available. So a good example of that would be previous stop and search records for an officer. And we now consider that as part of an investigation into an issue or an alleged, um, where, where, where there's allegations of discrimination. We've rolled out training internally uh, on handling race discrimination cases for, for targeted selection of our investigation staff right across the organization. And we developed internal guidance to support that. But we've also been talking to and listening to the communities who are concerned and consulting with those with the lived experience of this um, and use that to help shape our learning recommendations and promote awareness of those learning recommendations as well, because that's really important if we're going to affect that chain. And with stop and search, I think we, we typically see things like concerns about weak or insufficient grounds for stop. Uh, poor reasons being given, quick escalation of suspicion and switching of what the suspicion's for, uh, and then also quick escalation of use of force, um, use of handcuffs, that sort of thing. And what we did through this race thematic work is we've, we've looked at this and then we've, we've applied it to a number of cases, particularly in London, um, and uh, used that to make uh, some wider learning recommendations to the Met. Um, and those were quite important because they covered really key areas, some of which have already been mentioned. And also because we were able to engage with the London Mayor's Office um, when we developed these recommendations, uh, they, the key elements of them have been included in the Mayor's Action Plan for Policing. So I think that is a really good example of us beginning to work uh, more closely with other people and, and get this in. And the recommendations covered issues like legitimacy, training, um, for, particularly around de-escalation, uh, the use of body-worn video that's already been mentioned, use of force, and also how internal monitoring within the force worked and how external scrutiny was used. So those recommendations have been made, they've been accepted, and they've been built into the action plan. Um, we also know that use of tasers increasing and more officers are being trained to use them. Uh, home office figures show that tasers are really disproportionately used on black people. Uh, and I think they make up about 20% of those who tasers are used on. And we're currently investigating a number of incidents, um, some of which David will know about, um, where um, the tasers have played a key factor. And we are working with PCCs and deputy mayors as well to ensure that adequate scrutiny is in place for how tasers are being used. But we are really concerned about this and we have been looking at this. So we um, started an, a, a thematic review of taser use to look at learning. Um, and we're gonna be publishing a report on this very soon. And what we did to do this review is we looked at the existing data and, and literature around tasers. We then reviewed 101 of our independent investigations that involved taser use over a five year period. And then we looked at and, and heard the views and concerns of the communities and stakeholders around how tasers are used. Now, it doesn't present a full picture of taser use because we look at it through our lens of um, where there's complaints or issues, but we think it will contribute to the growing evidence base around taser use and help to develop a much deeper understanding of the way, way taser is used and perceptions, particularly of communities and stakeholders. Um, we're at the point now where we're just reviewing the final draft and we have developed recommendations from it. Uh, those recommendations will fall into four main themes, guidance and training, scrutiny and monitoring, data and research, and community input and engagement. And we should be publishing both the report and the recommendations this summer. So another piece of work that I think will help contribute to that wider system change. And that just brings me to just a couple of things that I want to say where, before I finish, which was about some of the areas where I think change is needed and we need to just look at this in the whole. Um, the, the broader theme about how um, what we need to work together right across the system, I think, is a really strong one. It was illustrated by the learning recommendations and broader recommendations. Um, we need to work with the college. We need to work with inspectorates to make sure we do that. But we also need to work with the forces and with others who are making recommendations to to bring those together. And we would support the idea of a national system for recording that and tracking pro progress. 
But similarly, if I go back to timeliness and delays, you know, we've now reached a point where we've made some really significant improvements in how long it takes. There is more we can do, but we have made big improvements in some of our cases. But what we find is that actually now when those cases perhaps go to a conduct hearing or if they're criminal go to court, that process add months or years sometimes to that case. And for the complainants and the witnesses and the officers in those cases, that's too long and that's something we'd like to change. It was a key part of what we were saying to Hask a couple of weeks ago. And it really is important that, that we, the police, the CPS, coronial services, are all working together uh, to try and prove that because we can't just do it bit by bit. We do need that whole system change. A link to that and systemic accountability, I think is my second area, which, which chimes in with what David was saying, which is around the need for cultural change, particularly in some areas of policing. I think the debate that recent high profile cases have drawn attention to has shown some really poor example of police culture. Um, often this is exposed through social media and um, it is our belief that there just cannot be a place for racism, misogyny or homophobic views in modern policing. Um, I know that's shared by a lot of police officers and it is rare, uh, but it is wrong that, that that still exists and that social media you know, we are finding that on there and um, we would like that challenged. Um, it is really positive, though, that, so, that we are seeing increasingly colleagues calling out their colleagues on this. And that's where a lot of our recent reports come from. Um, and we wrote to the MPCC recently, hoping to work with them to look at that. And I think the uplift in police numbers that are coming and the wider focus of society on these issues that we're talking about today means that actually we're in a really good opportunity to change and deliver the cultural shift that we need. So I'm going to pause there, uh, but thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, for that. Shomik, um, you're going to follow on, tell us, you know, do you think that the IOPC is holding the police accountable? Uh, 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 or is it fit for purpose? Do you have a view on that? Thanks. Well, I'm sure well, you do. I do, I do, and a number of practitioners do, and our clients certainly do. Um, look, it's always good to meet with the IOPC in forums such as this, because we do need an ongoing discussion around what it is doing well and what it's not. And also the victims of police misconduct need an independent body to assist them. Um, regrettably, however, the experiences of our clients um, is not that the picture is as rosy as we have heard so far. Um, before turning to victims' current experience uh, in the IOPC in particular, I think it's worth remembering where we are now in terms of police misconduct and racial disparity. And um, some of it's been touched on already, uh, but, but everyone will be aware that disparities are evident in, for example, stop and search, use of force, including handcuffing, restraints, baton use, taser use, and the issuance of fixed penalty notices. And there's been an explosion in that during the pandemic. Um, there's also been an increase um, in police use of force at public protests, uh, even very recently arrests of legal observers, whose very job it was to monitor police misconduct. Now, in the wake of the racist murder of George Floyd, uh, the Police Action Lawyers Group, Inquest, and the United Families and Friends at, at campaign, three groups who supported countless victims, released a statement in support of George Floyd's family, which identified where we are now in the UK. And that's following the introduction of the IOPC in 2018. And I just want to read a couple of paragraphs from that um, because it puts the situation into historical context. The statement said, in our work, we see time and again, a pattern of cases synonymous with state violence, structural racism, impunity and injustice. We've also seen time and again, a shocking lack of accountability of individual state agents responsible for state abuses. Many inquests into state inflicted deaths have returned conclusions highly critical of the unlawful and excessive or disproportionate force used or found serious neglect. However, disciplinary action or criminal charges are rare and criminal convictions rarer still. Since 1990, there has been no successful prosecution for murder or manslaughter. Disciplinary processes as there have been rarely result in effective sanctions against the officers involved. And in addition, the various iterations of the police watchdog over the years have consistently failed to address race adequately or at all in their investigations. Now, I, I raise that not as a, as a criticism on its own of the IOPC, but as an encouragement as to, to give you the fortitude that our clients want you to have to do your job properly in light of the real struggle that there is to come to terms with this endemic issue. 
Um, our clients show tremendous courage in alerting responsible authorities to police misconduct and criminality. But in their eyes, the cultural problem that's persisted over generations within bodies such as the IOPC is that our client's courage is not reciprocated by them. And in order for there to be real change, there must of course be cultural change within police forces, but alongside that, independent authorities like the IOPC need to flex their muscles. And by that, I mean specifically use powers at their disposal and also identify where their powers are insufficient, leading to injustices. Um, now, Claire's touched upon some of the, the developments and the, the improvements there have been in legislation and um, some of the improvements that they have started to see. But, but I, I would say that there are still significant problems, even on some of those issues that have already been raised. Um, and I'd want to focus today on the failure to properly investigate race discrimination, delay and inconsistency. So starting with race discrimination, uh, the Police Action Lawyers Group provided evidence to the Home Affairs Select Committee last year um, and in doing so asked members of, uh, of, of PALG across the country for case studies, both good and bad, as to how forces, the IPCC and IOPC have handled complaints of discrimination. And we did not receive a single positive case study from a PALG member where a complaint of race discrimination was upheld and officers subject to sanction. And that's even where other aspects of the complaint were upheld. There was no case to answer in relation to discrimination. Now we should stop there because that should ring alarm bells given racial disproportionality, which we all know has been evident for generations um, and which I've outlined earlier during the pandemic. In our client's experience, there remains a cultural resistance to accepting that institutional racism exists, both within police forces, but also on behalf of the IOPC failing to acknowledge it exists in police forces. Also, cultural resistance to making findings that racism is a factor in any given case, except for in the very rare cases where racist language is used. Now, it would be useful in that context for the IOPC to put on record its position as to whether it accepts that institutional racism exists in police forces across the country. Um, if it departs from that view, what has changed since McPherson, insofar as the Metropolitan Police is concerned, to justify that departure? Um, it would be helpful to hear the IOPC's view on that. Now, Pyle made a, a number of recommendations to the Home Affairs Select Committee around how allegations of racism can be effectively investigated. Um, those which focus on the IOPC, um, some of which are as follows. Um, firstly, IOPC guidance explains that surrounding circumstances do need to be explored to see whether discrimination can be inferred. And I hear what Claire says about looking at patterns of conduct, which is welcome. Um, in the past, we've had to fight tooth and nail to see previous allegations made against officers before they're disclosed, and we can see that pattern of conduct emerging. And the IOPC are starting to do that. However, um, the guidance from the IOPC should make much more explicit that it reflects the statutory shift in the burden of proof which is set out in the Equality Act at section 136, as if the matter were litigated in the county court. But in such cases where a claimant can present sufficient evidence that they were unlawfully discriminated against, a civil court or tribunal must find that the claimant was discriminated against unless the defendant can show on the balance of probabilities that the treatment was in no sense whatsoever on the grounds of race. Now, incorporating a shifting burden of proof into the IOPC guidance more explicitly would ensure that the guidance is legally consistent and on a par with the approach used in the civil courts. And it would remove the, the risk of absurd situations where the same set of facts can lead to the dismissal of a police complaint, but the upholding of a subsequent civil claim for discrimination. I mean, it would also give greater incentive to officers and forces to provide fulsome explanations for their conduct. Um, it would mean that rightly, adverse inferences would be more likely to be drawn against officers from their lack of cooperation with a complaint investigation. Next, further work still needs to be done to ensure the guidance is properly applied by police forces and the IOPC in investigating complaints of discrimination, including through specific training as recommended by the Angelini Review. Cases must be referred to the IOPC by forces where there's an allegation that could give rise to misconduct, aggravated by discrimination, but we're still seeing far too often that just not happening, with forces still seeking to investigate in-house and the IOPC needs to keep an eye on that. And investigate that and keep statistics on that. Um, interestingly, we have seen in some recent cases chief police officers challenging unduly lenient sanctions against officers for discrimination 
where the complaint is by an officer against a fellow officer. But we haven't seen that approach in cases where a member of the public brings a complaint against an officer for discrimination. Um, now, recent decisions in the High Court, of which there have been a raft of those, um, show that the same principles really should be applied to discrimination complaints brought by members of the public. Um, one key principle is that the panel should focus on how such behaviour made the complainants feel rather than on any purported intention of the offending officer. Now that would avoid officers claiming ignorance when they know full well what they were doing and why they were doing it and its effect. And the panel in one case in the West Midlands had unduly focused on the personal mitigation of the officer at the expense of considering the impact on the officers who'd overheard very racist comments. Um, and one paradigm example of how the IOPC continues to fail in its duty to investigate race discrimination is one that's been in the public domain recently, um, in which the family have given me permission to, to speak about today. Uh, it's the case of XAB, in, in which my colleague Sophie Naftalin acts for the family. Now, those of you who will be aware of the case know that XAB was 17 years old at the time and suffers from learning disabilities. Um, but she had run away from a group while on an escorted walk and having become distressed, flagged down a police car near a main road. She informed the officers that she was a vulnerable child with mental health issues. She initially agreed to get into the police car, but then exited. And the panel heard that PC Kemp attempted to handcuff her. When this was unsuccessful, he used CS spray less than a metre from her face, and within seconds started using his baton, and in total struck her over 30 times. The panel concluded PC Kemp was striking her with his baton during and after she was tasered by another officer. Now, PC Kemp was dismissed for gross misconduct. And subsequent to the case, a member of the IOPC team appeared on Channel 4 News to describe it as the most disturbing case he'd ever seen in his entire career. Now, unfortunately, that statement was at odds with what the IOPC initially found, in which the family have given us permission to share. And the IOPC's approach um, initially was to split the investigation into two to deal with discrimination separately to the use of force. Now, in relation to the use of force investigation, um, at the end of its first investigation, it found that if proved, the officer's conduct would only amount to simple misconduct. So despite over 30 baton strikes and the use of CS gas on a vulnerable child, the maximum sanction the IOPC thought appropriate, if found guilty, was a written warning. He would have kept his job. Now, there's been a second report into the case, which we are told addresses discrimination, but the IOPC decided that our client was not an interested party, and so we've not yet seen that report. They've now relented in the face of complaints, and so we await their report. But even without reading it, we know the terms of reference does not include an examination of race discrimination, only mental health and age discrimination. In view of all this, it's apparent that there remains a cultural resistance to accepting institutional racism exists, and also a cultural resistance to investigating properly individual officers' conduct and whether racism is at play in any given case. Uh, now, Claire has mentioned delay, um, and delays in matters brought to the IOPC are often caused by the officers complained against and other third parties. Uh, and a number of us uh, practicing in this field and the victims um, welcomed the IOPC's statement recently, um, which made that clear um, that individual officers are often the cause for delay. But there is also substantial delay in the IOPC itself. Um, I hear what um, Claire says in relation to the number of investigations now completed within 12 months, which is commendable, but we really need to see whether those investigations are the most serious investigations. Um, are they ones where special requirements apply? Are they ones involving deaths in custody or serious injuries? Uh, we suspect not, but it would be good to hear um, and to see the statistics on that. Um, it's important to drill down on those statistics. Um, also, are they cases where at the outset the IOPC has found, as we find in all too many cases, that the officer's conduct would not be subject to special requirements? And that means that um, they would not be subject to dismissal or misconduct proceedings or prosecution. Um, Dame Ailish Angelini said in her review into deaths in custody that investigations into police related deaths should be conducted in the same way as you'd expect an investigation into a civilian death. Timeliness is an absolute priority. And that's repeated by countless families whose loved ones die following police conduct. With regard to deaths in custody, investigations following an inquest can, in our experience, continue to take years. 
And we've seen one where an inquest concluded in June 2019 and the scoping exercise by the IOPC has only just completed. So again, the IOPC frequently try to blame third parties, but often it can be at least partly down to the failure to recognise that they need to get hold of obvious evidence themselves, um, even as obvious as transcripts from a trial or an inquest. Inconsistency is the final um, issue I wanted to deal with, and, and there's great inconsistency in the manner in which police complaints are investigated and then progressed through the system, including in appeals. Uh, when we gave evidence to the Home Affairs Select Committee in 2013, I believe it was, um, we described islands of good practice, and in our experience that remains the case. Islands of good practice do exist, and the system is capable of ensuring officers are at the very least brought before the criminal courts in the most serious cases. For example, we know that at the moment officers are on trial following the death of Daly and Atkinson. However, seeing officers face prosecution is vanishingly rare, and in our client's experience, there's inconsistency in a number of areas, um, in particular the following, which can scupper effective investigations at the outset. I've already touched upon the special requirements point, and it is a real problem that many of our, our, our colleagues, practitioners and, and victims are facing, where investigations are pushed down um, as if they are minor incidents for which officers should not face misconduct tribunals when clearly they ought to. Those decisions are being made before the evidence has been reviewed, um, before clients have been spoken to, um, essentially prejudging the outcome of a complaint. Now, it's no good saying that complaints um, have been um, dealt with speedily if they're not effective. And so effective and speedy, uh, those have to be the watchwords. Um, we also often rarely see officers being arrested. Um, and finally, we see very poor appeal decisions. Now, an email went around my team earlier this afternoon from a colleague expressing real frustration at having received three very poor appeal decisions in a row from the IOPC. And she described it to me as just more of the bad old days of the IOPC all over again. I mean, those appeals, there was a lack of analysis, evidence of bias towards the officers, and a basic failure to grasp the legal and social implications of the matters complained of. Uh, one example was of an appeal decision which failed to even mention, much less analyse, the key ground of appeal, which was that the police had mixed our clients up with another boy with the same first name, which rendered all of their claims about him false. My colleague finished by saying that she would in any event be sending all these decisions to you, Claire, to ask for your views as to whether you think they're acceptable. And so all of us at Bat Murphy are looking forward to, to your response on them. Um, Ultimately, in conclusion, the statute and regulations should be capable of providing a framework for accountability. However, it depends on all of the people who have to discharge a role within that system, having the skills and the courage to do it properly. I just want to conclude with words from Aji Lewis, uh, the mother of Olashane Lewis, who died after police use of restraint, who said as follows, it might be more of a deterrent if the police were genuinely concerned about facing charges. They pretend there isn't institutional racism in the police, but we all know it's there. The police need to admit mistakes and officers need to be prosecuted. And in the vast majority of our clients' cases and in their view, regrettably, we're still some way from that idea. Thanks, Shamik. Um, uh, Claire, uh, a lot there uh, for you in particular. Um, I uh, just picking up on uh, one of the broader questions, Shami Carson. I'm not going to deal with particular cases, but um, he asked, do, "Do you have a view, you, the IOPC, as to whether the police uh, are institutionally racist?" And uh, and of course, uh, I appreciate we're talking about different police forces. Uh, across the country. But one of the things you've told us about, um, uh, and I think something that the IOPC is putting a, a lot of effort into is this kind of um, a thematic area of focus and that being uh, race discrimination being in a thematic area of focus. It, it, is the fact that you're actually focusing in that area um, an acknowledgement of the fact that the police are institutionally racist or or is it something else so i think we we are I mean, and i make no apology for this we are always really cautious about going down the route of saying we think the police are institutionally anything and the reason we do that is we look at the police through one lens 
and that is through the lens of the complaints and investigations that we do and we do not have you know the whole oversight that we would have if you also rolled in HMIC the college policing to us however I think that doesn't stop us being prepared to say where we think there are systemic issues that need to be looked at and examined. And part of the reason we are doing this thematic work is to look at that. And you know, our report will, will come out later in the summer where we will, you know, be calling out what we see. You know, Sal, who's leading on that piece of work, um, who's our London regional director, you know, is certainly not someone who is going to duck away from that. Um, and I think that um, as an organization, I think in the past we have lacked a bit of bravery and and there have been times when we need to stand up more strongly I think we are doing that more so sometimes that is about saying we got it wrong and doing it differently I'm not ashamed of that I think that's an important part of being an organization that's learning um, but we we have to work within our powers and remits so some of the things that were said just now you know it's just not in our power to change the burden of proof um, you know we we have to work with the remit we've got and I think that um improving that and doing that and being more vocal about that you know with the taser report and with the the um discrimination thematic work will be will be a really important part of that uh Shomik, i don't think that is what you were saying about the the burden of proof um do you want to come back on that no it's not it's that the the guidance can be interpreted in accordance with that burden of proof um but and I don't accept this, but if the IOPC think that it's um, currently not possible, they really need to do something about that. That's about flexing muscle, it's about lobbying. Um, I don't, however, accept that it does need to, to change. It's something that simply needs to be reflected more clearly in the guidance. Um, and uh, others have something to say about that as well. I, I've, I think I've got something that's potentially helpful, um, which arises from the Court of Appeal judgment in W80. Um, which I know you're familiar with, Claire, because we touched on it when we had a pre-meeting. Um, and as you'll recall, the Court of Appeal uh, considered that the Code of Ethics was a primary guide to the tests that should be adopted in scrutinising officers' conduct, which you might say is a matter of common sense. Um, and of course, the, the Code of Ethics puts some positive obligations on police officers in respect of their conduct. Uh, requiring it to be non-discriminatory and requiring them to take positive steps to address the special needs of protected characteristic groups. So that's actually a very good fit already between Section 136 of the Equality Act and the Code of Ethics. But I think if you start looking at how the Court of Appeal um, is expecting the IOPC, and of course the IOPC were defending your own decision making in WAT under attack from WAT and, and the Metropolitan Police, but you follow through the logic of, of the outcome in the Court of Appeal, then you would be very much able to embrace that very sensible methodology, which, of course, I mean, that dates from, from the 1970s um, Race Relations Act um, and the original discrimination, anti-discrimination legislation, acknowledging, as you have, Claire, that it, it's simply not possible in the majority of instances to get that direct evidence to prove discrimination. That's why the law has created these adaptions. And indeed the code of ethics, it's all there. So I think that might be something quite interesting to look at. Claire, there is um, a question um, from one of our colleagues at Darty Street who, who picked up on something that you said and asks, um, what is the specific cultural change that the IOPC say is needed? I think that's something you just said when you were speaking. Yes, I think um, we, we're talking about it in quite a broad sense. And I think um, it stems from, um, if you like, the, the lens that perhaps seizing phones or devices has given us onto seeing some of the exchanges that are going on between officers on WhatsApp groups and other private messaging services um, where we're seeing really derogatory language being used, um, uh, very unpleasant things said about victims, that sort of thing. And, and you know, I really emphasize this is a very minority, but it is groups of police officers, sometimes even with members of the public in, in those groups as well, who are saying things. And we feel that that, although it's a very small minority 
uh, is a reflection of a part of a culture. I think you can then extend that out a bit further if you look at, and I know this isn't the topic of tonight, but the increase we're seeing in APSP cases, um, and again, how social media has enabled that um, a lot more, and we're seeing more cases as a result, um, and that abuse of position um, to, to the, the, that is part of that offence. And I think that um, what we'd like to see, and we are pleased to see individual officers reporting each other and where that is happening a bit more now. Uh, but we've we've seen other abuse of position cases more recently of you know violence and things like that. And I think uh, it's about having a conversation about um, you know, do, do those more serious offenses reflect a lower level culture that exists in the, the banter and other things that are going on. And I think some concerns came out around, you know, the broader dialogue we were having over the summer as well. So I think um, it, it's that broader culture, which I think you can then extend, you know, if you're, if you're seeing racist language uh, on WhatsApp groups, you know, how does that, what, what is that a reflection of that is happening in stops and search and things like that. And I think that does reflect culture even if it's in very small areas or perhaps even just one or two stations or groups, if that's happening, then um, we want to see that challenged. We want to see um, much stronger training, for example, and, and thinking about how that comes through. Um, you know, we've had one ex example recently where we sort of looked at the background of some of the officers involved and there were a real mixture of people who had just been through induction training through to people who've been in the force 18, 19 years. And so that, you know, again, I think is, is an opportunity to ask questions of those who are responsible for training with the uplift and that side of it. So it's that broader little bits of what we're seeing of culture and just asking the question of what that's reflective of. David, can I ask you, what do you think about this notion of, of, of something being culturally endemic or widespread but actually only limited to a small minority of people does that does that make sense to you in terms of the way you understand structural and institutional racism there has been a myth in the uk um it's probably existed because it's important to remember that black people make up 4% of the population and ethnic minorities make up 14% of the population as a whole. But there's been a myth that um, if we could just get to diversity, if we could just get to the police and uh, organizations with power reflecting the broader community, we would be able to crack some of these problems. And I've always said that that is really required as a basis for a conversation and a, and, and a basis for um, a degree of trust. But please don't be naive that that is sufficient because where it's sufficient, we would not see systemic issues of racism in the LAPD or, the, or, or NYPD or, or various forces um, uh, across the world where actually they have cracked the diversity thing. But it is important to remember, of course, that in Britain, just 1% of police officers are black. Um, and I think that it we have to acknowledge, and I, I, now I'm not almost, we, I'd like to have a sociologist, psychologist on the panel to speak to this. Because uh, I don't think Claire can easily speak to this. Shemek will have his views, but we have to acknowledge that in the wake of George Floyd and the pandemic, something came to the fore last summer that felt cultural. Uh, the handcuffing, the violent stop and search, the fining, and police notices then we had these totemic cases jordan walker brown in my constituency paralyzed saw him just two weeks ago um mina smallman's girls and i'm in very close contact with mina um that of course has led to a lot of angst, not just actually, it's really important to say this, not just within black communities, 
it, it really to diminish it to black communities is wrong. It's a it's a public concern actually. It's a wider public concern that goes beyond any minority group about what really is going on. Um, now, just one thing to say because I, I I can't I can't answer that what, but I can say it feels deeper than just a small minority. However, I want to put on record, I meet many, many police officers in the course of my 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 day to day work who appear to me to be uh, uh, fantastic public servants going about their business, determined to do the best job that they can. And, you know, I meet officers that come from the streets of Tottenham. I meet officers, you know, so so, I, so that is the case. So that is really important. To put that to put that on the record, despite a culture that has that has arisen, I want to just say one other thing. We do know that police officers, you know, many of them were pensioned off a few years ago, and there was concern when the government did that and made drastic cuts to police uh, that any of the gains that were made following McPherson would be lost, and that new people would join, young people. Um, with none of some of the, none of the, you know, different, um, what's the word, different uh, um, employment uh, rights and practices, and that there might be some real issues around culture. And I just wonder if this, if there's some issues with a younger generation of police officers that come into the ranks uh, and what we see over the course of 2020 into 2021 because it does it, it creates a pattern of behavior it feels to be cultural and not just the tasering I haven't even mentioned the tasering widespread tasering caught on film that you just simply can't answer that requires requires something a, a deeper dive than just you know a few rotten apples So, so Claire, part of this focus on um, thematic focus on discrimination is, is, well, it is this deep dive, is it, in a sense that um, David's talking about. C could you help us? What once you've done that work, which obviously we're all very keen for you to do, and um, and and look forward to to your findings. What do you intend to do with that? Because this is part of you know these sort of problems that we talk about all the time more more recommendations yet another report yeah. you're going to do all of that work it's 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 timely yeah but but what you write a report it'll be filed somewhere and then what just help me yeah that, so so a large part of it is informing our practice and 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 getting our our work better and we're already seeing some of the input that and that that will continue. Um, I think that we very much see this as part as an ongoing. So this won't be a report and then we'll just shut down the thematic work strand. Um, this is where, where we will continue to um, capture the data from, from cases that come in. We will continue to call cases in where we um, feel we need to and build on that. And I think that um, we're very keen this doesn't just become another set of recommendations. I think there's been a lot of work around that. Um, but, you know, we've heard we do need to make sure our learning recommendations more broadly have impact. Um, so we'll be thinking about it through that side as well um, and very much be looking to use this as a way of going forward and playing our role in working to deliver some change in that. Uh, and um, did you say this year that you were you were hoping to we, complete we, that work? To have a report in the summer, yes. Yeah. Right, and uh, we don't have much uh, time, but uh, I wanted to pick up on something else that you said, just th th that sort of accountability is obviously not just about police, uh, holding the police to account is obviously not just about the IOPC, uh, and you have to work with other organizations and you 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 spoke of delays that can get in, in your way even if you speed up your processes and in that context you talked about the cps you talked about the appropriate authority and the misconduct panels do you, do, do you want to tell us a little bit uh, about that and uh, the challenges that brings to your door 
Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. So um, I, mean, I think particularly if we, we look at the delays that happen once we've closed our investigation, um, we then obviously have um, a, a, an ongoing role to play as that case progresses through, be it to the AA and for a conduct hearing or to the CPS or indeed to the coronial process. And we, we're now at the point where over half our workload is post-closure. So uh, that means after the investigation. Um, and that, that's a big resource demand for us to, to keep maintaining that because that length of time, you know, it creates work for us as well as other people. So um, we have done a lot to improve how we handle disclosure um, over the last 18 months or so. Um, we have uh, started to trial having dedicated teams doing this work. But we do find particularly, for example, I think with coronial processes, we end up doing an awful lot of work to support inquests and that side of it because of lack of resourcing in some parts of the system. So I think um, these delays cost all of us and have an impact on all of us. So it's important that we can try and bring that back, that we can work with the CPS, for example, to speed up their decision making, um, that we can uh, then do our part in helping AAs get hearings to to happen quickly as well and and that side of it so we we are focusing on how we can improve what we do but you know we are only one side of one part of that going forward so we do need and i think you know covid has had a real impact it's made it much harder be it getting listings in court um or or just you know with some hearings having those and um i think we, we're all going to need to be part of that post-covid drive to to really reclaim some of that time that has been lost Thanks, Claire. Uh, but, but before I wrap up, I just I promised our friends at Inquest um, who are with us in the audience today. Uh, and since you mentioned Inquest, it just triggered my memory that Inquest themselves are carrying out some research work. And um, what they want to do is, is look at why race and racism continue to be omitted from investigations into police conduct. And it, it, it presumably they'll be liaising with you uh, as well uh, when when a black person dies following police conduct so that's that's their focus and they ask me to to tell all of you to get in uh, touch with Ray Prashad, who's the uh, policy and research officer there particularly lawyers working in the field um, because she'd like to, to to hear from you and to um, you know gather evidence that you can help on this particular topic. So um, this is a call out to, to all the lawyers um, here today to get in touch with Ray Cup, please. All right, well, it just uh, remains for me really to thank um, our guests uh, in particular. Thank you so much um, for, for coming here. And, and Claire, thank you uh, for, 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 for coming here and knowing that uh, perhaps you would uh, face some difficult questions uh, from us and from our audience. And um, uh, thank you, David, for making the time this evening. And Shamik, thank you as always um, for your support. And last but not least, Fiona, um, for introducing this whole uh, event. Uh, Fiona and I are trying to cook up um, uh, the next, um, event in this series. Uh, we haven't told David yet, but um, but, but we are <laughs> hoping to <laughs> we are hoping to continue on this theme of accountability and focus in particular uh, on, on the role of the Crown Prosecution Service um, in, in, in terms of de we delivering justice that, yeah. in, in that context uh, as far as police officer prosecution goes so we'll we'll be in touch uh and tell you about that i think my job effectively is to strong arm the cps into coming and i and i think it is important to say that claire um did not need to be strong armed she very happily came so we're very grateful <laughs> that is that is absolutely right um well i don't know what you said to her behind the scenes david but <laughs> but, but certainly um she, she came uh, without us making her. So uh, thank you again, um, all of you. Thank you very much, Maya.